This book is literally so bland it makes potatoes flavorful. Hello and welcome to another video. This time I'm going to be tearing apart this really generic young adult fantasy book. I'm so glad I didn't pay any money for this. Because if I had, I would be going up to Waterstones, or wherever I bought it from, and be demanding a refund. You'll probably want to know what it's about. Let's read the synopsis on the back, shall we? Celestra is heir to a powerful magic. Locked away in a tower by a cruel king, her destiny is to foretell death and harvest doomed souls to feed his immortality. Nox is a soldier who has spent years plotting vengeance on the crown. Now he's determined to steal the king's immortality and kill his entire court, starting with Celestra. But when Celestra and Nox's futures become entwined and death seeks both their souls, they're forced to put their trust in each other. Can they work together to escape their dark fate? Yes. This book is marketed as a kind of Rapunzel retelling. Um, there's also an enemies to lovers relationship. Enemies to lovers, more on that later. But I think we should just dive in with the thoughts while reading segments because this, it wasn't even a wild ride. It was just the most boring train journey ever. Instead of the cover, although like I really don't like this cover, I quite often like judging the book by its first line. This is this book's first line. I can tell someone when they're going to die. It's kind of a weird introduction. Just imagine your doorbell rings and the person at the door just looks at you and says, oh, by the way, you're going to die on Thursday. It's kind of weird. I think the author was trying to write like a really intriguing line to really pull you in, but she ended up writing this. Apparently Celestra's got green hair. She's quirky, everyone. She's really, really quirky. Something that already took me out of the story was the excessive use of the enter key. Every time a point was made, pretty much, there would be a line break. They can't stand the sight of my green hair. Enter key. I almost laugh at that. Enter key. Was this written on Wattpad or something? Enter key. Is it possible to have a paragraph longer than four lines? Enter key. Yay, it's five lines. Oh my gosh, how incredible. Oh my gosh, I found one that's six lines long. It did take me 14 pages to find it, though. There's some interesting word choices. Celestra, he all but purrs. How do you purr? Is this guy a cat? When there's expositional dialogue, but you already know that the characters are totally aware of how the system works. Nox's lips curve upwards. So he smiles. I am known to drive women crazy. Sure, Jan. I guess I really can sweep women off their feet. He's an arrogant little what's it, isn't he? So these characters' names are Celestra and Nox. Isn't Nox a surname? Isn't there that guy, what, what's he called? Professor Brian Nox? Oh wait, no, it's Cox. Actually, that's worse. She's a wild and reckless thing. I'd hardly call sneaking out of your oppressive tower wild and reckless. Brave and a bit stupid because she is the heir to this kingdom and people will recognize her with the green hair and everything. Yeah, they're all a bit delusional because they think that they can take down this all powerful king and then there's Celestra, her psychic, Nox and his psychic. So, you know, where's, where's the strategy there? Delusion. <laughs> Convince yourself. You killed me with your dazzling personality. What personality does she have, Nox? You know the romance is not established well when the characters have to basically spoon feed it to us. Nox's sidekick, who called uh, Micah, says, You're really charming her, aren't you? How many times does this girl swallow? Like, it's actually quite an effort to swallow unless you're eating food because you have to sort of go, you know? So they've begun their journey to take down the king? Nox is falling out the sky and he says, I feel a new bruise forming, just another one to add to the collection. 
This guy apparently collects bruises like they're Pokemon cards. Straight after this ordeal, Celestra straight up says to Nox, did I mention I hate you? Oh yes, by the way, this is meant to be an enemies to lovers. Why do you actually hate him? Because so far I've seen no reason for you to actually hate him. Okay, yeah, he's arrogant, but to be honest, this soon gets dropped. Characters' personalities shift with the plot, I swear. Because they've basically fled the kingdom, they keep worrying that Celestra's green hair is going to draw attention to them. Does hair dye not exist in this universe? So many of their problems could have just been solved by Celestra dyeing her hair. Do I actually know anything about these characters' personalities? I'm like a child unable to answer a question on a test because I've got nothing. Nox thinks that Celestra is capable of reclaiming her family's magic because it's in her eyes. They're kind. What does having kind eyes have to do with anything? Oh yeah, he didn't steal that. He's got kind eyes. What? So they end up in Polynesis, where they end up running into one of Celestra's ancestors who tells Celestra that she's, she's really meant to be queen. But in order for her to become queen of Polymestis, she's got to complete some trials. Nox and Celestra get into a scene of conflict because Celestra didn't tell him that she knew his father before he was killed by the king. Everyone's killed by the king in this book. She has no good reason not to tell him that she knew his father. She just didn't. For that reason, Nox is not a happy bunny because Celestra basically misled him this entire time. Is Nox trying to write like a self-help book or something? Because he keeps coming out with these random motivational lines. When Nox is about to die from a snake bite, Celestra thinks to herself, I love him. Like two seconds ago, you were telling us that you were enemies. So like, where, where, where did you change? The trial section of this book is literally nothing more than just go into this dodgy looking forest and find some random object and you'll be queen. That's all it is. I just want to finish this, but there's still a hundred pages to go. Ah. Anyway, let's get into my review. But first, let's cut to Dr. Chemical Penguin, who's going to tell you the average formula for a successful enemies to lovers book. Hello, I'm Dr. Chemical Penguin and I'm so poorly funded that I don't even have a whiteboard to make my points. Today, I'm going to be talking about how I would write an enemies to lovers arc. Part one, the characters have to take an instant dislike to one another. It can be a petty reason at first, but there's got to be a reason. You can't just tell us that the characters are enemies and expect that to be enough. Give us a reason that they just don't gel well together or that they're up for the same job promotion or scholarship. Number two, their dislike deepens. They seem to keep coming into contact with each other far too much for their liking, and they always make a point of insulting or in some more spiteful cases, stitching up their enemy, usually through some banter. But oh no, three, they're forced together. Be this a group project, a trip, an expedition, they're forced to set aside their differences for the time being and work together to achieve one common goal. Part four, they gradually start to soften towards one another. The key word here is gradual. It tends to be a series of events where the characters start to question their dislike for one another but over time. And then number five, there's some sort of romantic advancement. But they still definitely hate each other. Until eventually, they stop spritzing themselves with delusion and realise, yes, they'd actually be pretty good together. The characters were just... Like, I did not care at all about any of the characters because we were not given anything to care about. If somebody told me this was a first draft, I'd think, okay, but this book seriously is in dire, dire need of an editor. But apparently this was edited by a Holly West. I'm convinced like that person doesn't even exist. Conspiracy theory. It's also kind of marketed as a Rapunzel retelling. 
while there are nods to Rapunzel, it's definitely not a retelling. It just feels like another example of the publishing industry almost deliberately trying to market books wrong so that people will buy them. I'm just so tired of formulaic fantasy books like this, where the characters have no depth whatsoever. The plot I could summarise in like a sentence or two. It's so predictable and just like, it's not even, not even so bad that it's actually entertaining to read. It's just bad and so bland. I mean, I understand why somebody who hadn't read fantasy before might really enjoy this. So I, I get that. I can make a whole video about how I'm kind of fed up with the, the current state of the publishing industry, almost deliberately marketing books wrong so they sell, but not so that people enjoy them. I think that's all I want to say about this book. It's not good. I wouldn't recommend it. But anyway, I hope you still enjoyed this video. I hope you like the little Christmas tree in the background. It's December, apparently. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. Please like and subscribe because I must demand you to do that. Otherwise, I don't think I can call myself a YouTube person. Anyway, goodbye.